Hello everyone, welcome back to the Greenwood and Milner show here on Newcastle Fans TV. Alongside myself, Jonathan Greenwood, and my co-host Sam Milner, we are joined by BBC Radio Newcastle's lead commentator, Matthew Raysback, who has given us some fantastic, I was going to say some fantastic, what's the word I'm looking for? I was going to say scenes, but it's not scenes because of being <laughs> radio. But it feels Noises. like I should say scenes. Noises, yeah. scenes, <laughs> gonna, we'll go with anything you want. Audio scenes, there we go, audio scenes. I think that's a new one for me anyway. But you did take over Mick Lowe, uh, over Mick Lowe's in November 2016, Matthew. And since then, it's been an absolute roller coaster on the pitch. I can't imagine <laughs> you've, you've enjoyed it as much, but you must have enjoyed the last six months incredibly, uh, incredibly so. Yeah, well, firstly, thanks for having me on. Um, it's good to speak to you both. I've, I've seen um, your show before and... and various no you haven't I have on the uh, on the channel and um, I, i'll start by complimenting what you do because there's a lot of really good fan led fan run media out there um lots of choice for newcastle's fans but um i do enjoy what you both do so it's uh, it's nice to be with you and um thanks for having me thanks for your interest um as far as what you say about moments and noises um the thing that i always stress is that we're in a very privileged position because we get to describe the action for people who can't be there who can't see it at the time and i know uh, and, and it's great for us as a radio station that the, the club uh, who are our broadcast partners put our commentary out on nufc tv over the highlights uh, and that's um, introduced what we do to a worldwide audience um, because we can't put commentaries on the, the BBC websites for broadcast rights restrictions. Um, but these big moments, these goals, these games, um, they're not our moments. They belong to the players, the club, the fans. So it's our job to try to do them justice and, and reflect what they mean, uh, the importance of each goal and also the bigger picture. Um, but there's been a lot to get excited about recently uh, in in the last few months, especially with the results, the games, the performances, and some of the goals as well, um, and some of the near misses, um, including Callum Wilson against Arsenal, which I uh, still can't believe it didn't go in. Um, so, look, we, we enjoy doing what we do anyway, but when things are good on the pitch, it's even better for us, it's easier for us, and I'm sure it's better for anybody listening or watching. You say it's like the players' moment and the, and the team's moment and whatnot, but a, a good commentator makes it for the viewer or the listener or whoever. Like when the club, I mean, it's the first thing I do when I get home from a match, see if the club's part of the goal with with you and Ando on, on comms. And it, it, it does, it just makes it. I'd, I mean, whether it be a late comeback at Goodison Park after a horrendous <laughs> 94 minutes. Or, or whether it is a Callum Wilson goal, a moment of magic, a last gasp, Isaac Hayden winner, or a, a bit of magic from Bruno. Do you sort of, when you get home from a match, are you like the rest of us? Do you watch that clip of yourself? Do you hate watching yourself or listening to yourself back? Or are you like, yes, classic Razor? <laughs> Definitely not the last one. <laughs> oh, um, that's what I'm like. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I must say that all the comments we get um, and... We, we do get a lot of nice comments and, and I make sure Ando hears them and sees them because he is a massive part of what we do. Uh, and he's been co-commentator who's well, been involved in radio since before he retired. So I think we're, we're 30 years plus for him now. And he's a great help to me because of his experience in the media, whether that's getting to a ground, knowing where the car park is, um, or just actually during the game, his, his understanding of how a radio commentary should work is really, really useful. Um, and, and I've benefited from that. Um, but it, in terms of the response and the reaction, um, I try to listen back to everything that we do. I mean, in radio generally, whether it's a music presenter or a news reader or a speech broadcaster doing, doing news, you all have to listen back to your work and what you do. And it's not easy because I think you never truly get a sense of how your own voice sounds to other people. And it always sounds weird to you. And you might be the same with um, your channel in the videos that you do. If you see yourself, you hear yourself, you think, do I really, did I say that? Does it really come out that way? 
So there's a lot of that and you have to analyze yourself and be critical and get feedback from other people. Um, and also it's radio commentary. So it's not intended initially to, to go on top of pictures, but if it sits on top of pictures or, or underneath pictures um, and, and works okay, then I, I guess that's good. But I think because radio is about sounds and, and, and when you're listening on the radio, you can't be there. So you get the atmosphere. Um, you might get some of the shouts from the side of the pitch, quite close at St. James's Park. You might even hear, uh, you know, the ball crashing back off the woodwork or whatever. I think when you when you put all that in and then you've got the pictures, it, it can just really come together and create something really special. Um, and if people like it, that's brilliant. And um, I'm really, really slow and bad at replying to nice messages on Twitter, but uh, I do see them and very, very grateful for all the comments. But um, no, I, I try not to to watch those clips because often if I go on my on Twitter, on my phone or Instagram, um, I've got my own voice coming back at me, which is horrible. So I mute it straight away. Um, but I'll always listen back to everything that we've done and, and try and do things better or do things differently or, or do something again that, that might work quite well. Um, and that's all part of the, the process that we go through. I think that self-awareness, if you like, of how you want to sound or how you intend a piece of commentary to go is quite fascinating, actually, because I suppose there's not going to be the perfect commentary as much as we'd like it to be that, that way in our own heads. It, it's just almost impossible. It's almost impossible because the big thing with commentary, you can't predict what's going to happen. It's like, it's not like many things. You know, Bruno might not play that ball, he might play a different ball. Or St. Maxton might not take that shot and make a pass instead. So it must be very difficult. How quickly are you thinking in your head of how you're going to portray it to the listeners? Yeah, well, it has to be automatic and it has to be authentic. And all the reasons you've given are the reasons why you can't script a commentary. And it's probably the longest unscripted broadcast on a radio show or a television channel that you'll get. Um, what we do before the game and, and half time and full time, there's elements of, of, of scripting to that, whether it's just a running order with a, a line that we'll say into the interview with a manager or a player. But once the game starts, you know, I've, I've, got, I've got a notebook here and I'll, I'll maybe put it up to the camera later where I've got stats uh, and things that will illustrate points that we're making, whether it's a record uh, against a certain team or uh, attacking or defensive stats, um, which for the last few years have normally been quite bad and quite quite negative. Um, they're a little bit better now. Uh, or in individual player records. So um, let me let me think. If um, uh, Joe Linton scored at Norwich and it was his 100th Premier League appearance, he scored two goals. So you know if he scores that you'll mention that. You know, he scored and marked his 100th appearance in the Premier League with a goal, that kind of thing. So you've got it. That's part of the research that you do. So those things, you try and commit them to memory or you have a look down and then you, you mention it either just after the goal or after the analysis and you come back in with it. Um, but in terms of the match play and the action, you've got to keep up with the play because it is fast and it is quick and it's changing and it can change so many times in, in, a, in a few seconds. Um, and I don't think you appreciate how quick and slick it can be, whether it's Newcastle or the opposition, unless you're there in, in the ground. Um, and then everything else is just, just a reaction to what you see. Um, I mean, there are there are some basics of, of commentary, I think, where you know it, it's about the what has happened, who's done it, um, what does it mean, that kind of thing. And then the, the, the why, is it any good or not, should come from the summariser. So my job is really to say what happens, and then John Anderson will tell you if it's any good or not and and if it is why and if it isn't why it's bad um we probably stray into each other's territories now and again if i describe something as really good or uh, um bad then and that's me doing his job of analysis similarly he might describe what's happening on the pitch at that moment but no you can't script it you've just got to react and, and and try and like i said at the start do the moment justice it's a great relationship, I think, you and Ando have got, because whether or not you're, you're analysing something or you've, you've got, as you mentioned there, you've got all your stats and figures and 
can like be so informative at times, and but then you'll have Ando shout at Jacob Murphy, just put it in the net, which is just just the best thing ever. And that's the great thing about YouTube because you're not, you don't have to be impartial, despite being BBC. That that you can have a little bit of leeway because you are there to watch Newcastle at the end of the day. You're right. I mean. We have to, we, first of all, we've got to be honest with, with what we see. You've got to describe it accurately. If it's if it's good, tell people that it's good. If it's not, then then be honest. And, and Ando can, a lot more than I can, tell you why that is. Um, we are delivering the match from the perspective of Newcastle United. So a lot of what happens with the opposition is is less important for us than it would be on talk sport radio 5 live or on television um, where you would get something that is a bit more down the middle so i, I guess you might say we are um, you know maybe a bit more partisan than than network national radio would be um, but because we are broadcasting to a northeast audience or newcastle fans through the club website around the world um, you know they want to know what what's happening from Newcastle's perspective. Um, you know, there's little things that happen, maybe even if it's just something like a player's gone to warm up, whether it's Trippier and Wilson at Manchester City at three, was it three nil down when they came on? I think it was um, certainly losing. Then that's important to Newcastle fans who can't see it, who are listening. Well, they want them to come back and play a part. That might be less, something like that might be less important to to the opposing team, the away stations commentary, um, or, or national radio. So, yeah, everything we do is 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 through what it means for Newcastle um, and the information and colour that we think is important to the fans. But then, as well, you have the enthusiasm and the excitement that we can hopefully get across because we are there to to describe the game for Newcastle United and for Newcastle fans. So when a goal goes in, of course, that is, that's just the best thing. And we get excited about that. When the opposition score, we're obviously not as excited. It's still a significant moment, but um, yeah, that's what you get on, on local radio up and down the country. And I think that Ando Murphy just put it in the net. Um, and I knew that was going to come up because it comes up in nearly every conversation I have. It just summed up that moment perfectly though, didn't it? He did. It, it, just talking earlier about authenticity, and, and that was that was him. It was just a pure reaction, a natural reaction. He was angry, and he couldn't believe it. I mean, it it seemed like a simple chance, didn't it? it first glance, and that's what we had, um, and that that was his reaction. He couldn't believe that he that he hadn't scored, um, and yeah, it was it was so well received, um, hundreds of thousands of views. I think he made it onto TikTok which um, is probably not somewhere he expected to be. Um, but it's, it, it's great that we can do that. And, and, I, and I enjoy that as well, being able to get excited about Newcastle. And, and that Murphy incident was in a game at the start of the season under Steve Bruce when the team hadn't won. Um, and it was a game that they dominated. And, and I mean, they battered Watford, should have, 20-odd shots should have won. And it, and it, it was still exciting, the, the prospect of, of what could happen of being on top of having chances. So even in bad times, the thought of what could happen because we don't know what's going to happen, maybe that's part of why we, we love the game and we, we go and we enjoy it, is still really exciting. So to be able to to describe that from a Newcastle perspective is, is great. I have to be honest, when I heard that, I'm surprised there was no exclusives when Jake and Murphy's through. And I'm thinking, is Matthew Raider going to have to apologise about the language that he's just heard? Because that must have been such a moment where he, he's done exceptionally well not to say a particular word in the middle of that um, line. But I suppose the co-commentary, well, the co-commentator is very, very important. Me and Sam have been very, very lucky to speak to Peter Drury. And he, obviously, speak, he talks about his relationship with the co-commentator and being Jim Beglin at the time. What do you want from the co-commentator? I'm not necessarily talking about just Andrew, but what do you as a main commentator want from that co-commentator? Yeah, uh, just quickly again on the Murphy thing. Um, we've both just come back from having COVID. We've missed the Leeds game the week before. So I think we were both um, quite excitable having been locked up for 
however long it was, I can't remember now, week and a half, something like that. Um, and I think that probably played a part. You know, we had probably a bit more adrenaline. Um, and, and Ando actually, I mean, he was he was angry. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure he banged his fist against the desk a couple of times. And at Watford, um, there's two rows of media seats. We were on the front, but it's at the back of the stand where the benches are, are which is on the far side um, to the camera. So we had it, we viewed it from the like the, the opposite angle, different perspective. Um, but I remember even even when he was saying it, because I I tried I had to stifle a laugh. I'll be honest. I was having to look around and people were turning and, and looking. But then Watford went down the other end and nearly scored. And when they didn't, went back to Ando and I mean carried on. And then we do our post match phone in for forty five minutes after the game. Um, I mean, he was he was he was giving it, you know, <laughs> giving it everything, and people were I think they were trying to do Zoom press conferences, and he was still at full volume, um, expressing his view. I mean, I've never seen him as animated or as angry, and I've never seen as many people like lean over, turn, and have a look, uh, but but actually in a nice way and enjoy it and and, and laugh along with him. So it was uh, it was brilliant, um, and and I think he's he's fantastic. Because as a, as a co-commentator, I mean, firstly, he's got a brilliant voice. The Irish accent is a popular one, but it, it's, it, you know, through the speakers and listening to him, it is a, it is a great voice and it, it cuts through, um, you know, with all, all the crowd noise. And it's, I think it's a, it's a recognisable and identifiable voice as well. So that's, that is important with it being radio. Um, the other things, I mean, in, in just basic terms, when, when there's been a chance, there's been a piece of play that requires some analysis I stop speaking um, whether that's quickly or or I, I do a little bit more of a roundup and a wrap and then he needs to come in which which Ando does um, he's seen a lot of football over the years he's seen a lot of bad football as well um, and I've been there with him when we've been doing our total sport phone in on a weeknight before the game he's been doing that for a couple of hours and then he's watching the match and it's awful and I feel for him because he's been on air for three four hours and it's 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 cold and yeah it's tiring um so i'm pleased for him that he's seeing some good stuff now um but it's 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 the tactical insight and particularly defensively with ando because he played at, at the back um mainly at right back um he's he's good with that positionally um i, I think with the way newcastle been in recent years under rafa benitez so structured and then the issues and the, the chopping and changing, if I can put it like that, under Steve Bruce defensively, that's been really good because Ando has been able to explain more about what's required in each, each position at the back. So that's the benefit of having someone who's been there and played. And, and even though it's in a different era, the fundamentals probably don't change uh, because he watches football, because he educates himself, he knows who's who, he keeps up to date with the game now. Um, we're very lucky to have him. And of course, there are moments when he gets really excited as well for bad reasons, but also for good reasons. I mentioned the Wilson chance against Arsenal. I mean, he was he was all over that, and he doesn't do it regularly. And I think when he is doing it, I mean, Bruno against Leicester, he he let out a, a shriek. That's great because I think we know it's something meaningful when he gets involved like that. So um, yeah, I'm I'm all for him doing that. Yeah, Bruno against Leicester. I was front row of the Gallagate that day. That was right in front of me. Yes, please. Yeah, that was good. Um, was it hard? Like, I mean, obviously, since 2016, it's been eventful. But in the past two years, it's been even eventful from highs and lows. And when we've just come back out of lockdown, empty stadiums and whatnot, is it hard to, to get that same energy across when... There's no one around, and, and are, you, are you quite fearful of, of kind of going over the top when it comes to a big chance for fear that players and managers might hear you in a way? Yeah, it's funny you should mention that because the, the first thing about the lockdown football is that um, we were so lucky to be there um, because the people who should be there, the fans couldn't. And that was never lost on us, but it was really weird. Um, it took a, it took a bit of getting used to. I think probably those did they have nine was it nine matches, um, possibly ten with a cup game in 2020. I mean the first two or three, it it, it was just bizarre. Um, 
you know, you've got all you've got all the players, you've got the staff, you've got you're in the Premier Premier League ground, and then the game kicks off, and and you can hear everything, you hear every whistle, every pretty much every shout from the bench, and a lot from the players, um, which I suppose gave you a different a different side of, of football that you wouldn't normally hear, but it, it was just strange, and, and you, you're absolutely right about the noise because. Like we we couldn't compromise what we did, and we still had to get excited when Newcastle scored or um, something happened at the other end. And you're shouting, but then there's no there's no crowd noise to 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 carry you through and and to, and to really lift it. Um, what we would do is we would play in just a, a generic football crowd um, piece of atmos underneath just to give it something but it was very low level and and generic so there were no whistles there were no cheers it was just so it because it made it sound a little bit better and obviously we'd have our effects mic on at the ground which wouldn't pick up that much but you would at least hear something even if it was you know a manager shouting or or, or whatever or some cheers from the staff um but yeah i mean the the analysts from both clubs or the media who'd sit nearby would hear every word that we said um, whether it was good or bad, so probably part of me was was conscious of that and and making sure that um, I didn't didn't say anything that was incorrect about the opposition. Um, but when when the action's underway, you just got to do it. I mean, we have headphones on, so that kind of blocks out what you might hear around you, and you just hear what your microphones pick up, which probably helped a bit. Um, but I remember the Joe Willock goal at Liverpool in particular. Uh, and at the time, um, I mean, I, I got very excited and just had one disallowed. Um, and I remember yeah. listening back and, and I thought, thought, if that had had crowd noise underneath, that would have probably sounded fine. But because it's just one, one isolated voice, it, it sounded a bit shrieky and, and shrill and just, yeah, too high. And I think that was, I think from a radio point of view, having the, the crowd, and we sit next to fans at St James's Park it makes a massive difference. But also, not just for a goal, because when you're listening to the radio, and I listen to a lot of football on, on radio as well, um, you get a sense of what's happening, not just from the commentary team, but also the crowd. Because a groan or a cheer or booing of the referee or whatever, um, or if something happens quickly, if there's a, you know, Sam Maxima picks it up and spins, uh, and, there's a, <gasps> and there's expectation. And that's all part of the, the I guess, the theatre of, of the sport on the radio. So that was missing. Uh, and, yeah, it's great to have that back, not just for the goals and the big moments, but just for everything in the game. But I do think it helps um, what we do sound better as well, having the crowd back. Um, but the lockdown football, I mean, some of it was some of it was awful, wasn't it? And, and there was a, a bad spell at the start of last year, yeah, up until March, April. It was it was really really tough. It was tough for you to watch. I bet um, really hard, and it was it was the same um, the same when you were there. Yeah, and it was also it was freezing and wet every week as well. Um, so that was that was tough, and yeah, I'm glad we're away from that, as I'm sure you are. But... Yeah, very much so. Very very much so. I would say we were we're lucky enough to watch it. No, I say lucky enough. We have to endure watching Newcastle United at the time. We have to have to talk about it. The, the only the good thing, the only good thing about lockdown football and the, the quietness in the stadium was Matt Ritchie. That was the only good thing, Matt Ritchie. That was it. Yeah, well, yeah, Matt Ritchie. Yeah, some of the players are more vocal than others, and I guess you you, you got an idea of that. Um, yeah, and, and you got you got you probably. I'm guessing you, this came through from TV as well, and I, I watched some of the games. Um, but I think a better insight into how things work on the touchline in the matches, um, it just because because you could hear more and there was, there was less going on around it. So I guess they're not, not going to be focusing on the crowd. Camera's going to be on the bench if it's not on the pitch. So um, that was that was interesting, and also the players as well because of um, the coronavirus restrictions. Players would have to be spread out so they wouldn't all be sitting on the bench. So you might have subs from another team, like only a couple of rows away from you. Or I remember at Morecambe in the in the League Cup, um, the Newcastle subs 
Tottenham's were, were sitting right in front of us, um, uh, just just on the row in front. So, um, yeah, I just think things like that were, were different. But most of those um, restrictions on where you can go in the ground and and, and spreading people out, staff and players uh, have, have ended now. Have been have been removed. I was just going to say, has VAR made commentary more difficult? Or does it add to the excitement? Uh, I think it's both, actually. Um, I, I, I think you, you make, I think you spot on with both because um, when when something is being checked that maybe you're not aware of initially, and it's going to benefit Newcastle, well, that is exciting. And then you're telling people, oh, there's a VAR check. Um, the Wilson penalty at Spurs last year, um, which was a bit ridiculous. Uh, I mean, they've had a lot yeah, going on. Stonewall, up. Stonewall. <laughs> but, I mean, Andy Carroll, I think, was the only one that appealed. Well, certainly he appealed in a big way. And and at that time, um, John Anderson was doing the, the co-commentary on away matches for, for all of last season for the league games um, from the studio looking at, at uh, TV pictures. So it's just there by my by myself um, a long way from the action right at the back and that I mean they didn't play well they were going to lose and then suddenly oh there's a VAR check so it can give you a bit of excitement it can lift a dull game it can it can change the direction and the flow of the match of course it can also go the other way when, when it's controversial and it goes against Newcastle like a Chelsea, a Chelsea away Man City at home Leicester away Liverpool I could go on there's loads um but it, it it's difficult, I think, in radio because TV, live TV, seem to have um, a link to the the VAR centre, so they're more aware of what's going on, so they can tell you um, what's being checked. I think sometimes Sky Sports are able to tell you why a decision was reached. Well, we don't get that information. I mean, we get to see replays, and and um, sometimes we can someone will will alert us to a, that there is a VAR check going on. Otherwise, we're we're guided by the announcements in the in the ground as well, so we can be a bit in the dark. Um, it also can make things trickier if you commit and you go big on a goal or a moment or something, and then yeah, it turns out that it doesn't count because it's been overturned. But you've just got to. I think we just have to follow the ball and and describe what we see, and then if it's wrong, if it gets changed, well, um, just reflect that afterwards um and and that's the way it is you know we can be wrong because var gets involved but we have to be right at the time if it's a goal i mean like i suppose it's it's kind of easy and well not yeah. easy but but if like a player's given it large from a celebration like an Obafemi Martins or a Lamana Lawalawa, they wouldn't be very good in the days of VAR if they've done 30 cartwheels and somersaults and then their goal gets disallowed. That could get a bit tricky. But um Matthew, what was what what do you think was the lowest point in whilst you've been commentating on Newcastle United? Was it in the championship? Was it was it even earlier this season? I mean, do you think we would have been going down if it wasn't for the takeover and Eddie Howe? Mm. Well, there have been a few highs, but there have been a few lows as well. I think probably that, that Watford game in January and that late equaliser, that was that was deflating, wasn't it? I'm sure you felt the same. Um, it was very late, 87th minute, something like that. Um, not a great game. And team at the bottom. I mean, a bit like Norwich and Brentford uh, in, in November uh, under Eddie Howe, matches that you earmarked um, for three points from. So, yeah, I think that, that was the one this season, but then they turned it around in the Leeds game the following week and, and then didn't look back. Um, I mean, it was hard earlier in the season under Steve Bruce. So it was spoke about that Watford game, but it was Wolves the following week, which was actually the last game before the takeover. And we we would normally drive, but this time we got the train. And I remember we were speaking to fans at, at the station at Wolverhampton, um, and and then we changed it York. And there were, there were a few lads who'd been to the game that I knew knew from home and um, talking talking to them. And and they just, I mean, they just lost all hope and and they lost interest. And some of them said that they, they wanted the club to go down just to punish Mike Ashley. And 
you know, that kind of attitude and atmosphere was, was prevalent then and it was hard and it was really hard to see a way out. Um, and, you know, we can't take personally what happens on the pitch because it's not about us. We've just got to describe it and then talk about the other events at the club. Um, but but at that point, I, I just saw a long, hard, horrible season ahead, heading probably for disaster. Uh, and I was worried after that Watford game as well. Well, not because I didn't have faith in, in, in the players or already how, but just because of the situation they were in. Um, but what a brilliant few months it's been since. Uh, there's been difficult situations as well. I mean, a lot of the tension between um, club and fans when Mike Ashley was owner, um, you know, there were some there were some moments, weren't there, where things things were not nice. And with Rafa Benitez in there, who, who would, would say his piece, um, there was always it felt like there was drama and and, and trouble brewing, I guess. Um, so yeah, I think there was probably just a just a general feel around the club at times um, where it was difficult, but um, to be to be where it is now with the hope and the optimism that it'll get better and all the changes that have been made and even just this week as we're talking um, it's nice to be able to look forward and look towards what will hopefully be a, a brighter future in terms of a game that, that was really bad I mean you mentioned that Everton won the 2-2 two, two, two. Um, yeah I mean that's you know every team has bad performances off days bad games but that was that was a really hard one and I, and I mentioned earlier Ando sometimes when he's He's done a phone-in show, and then he's, it's a night game, and it's cold, and they're not playing very well, and it's, it can be can be be hard to to really really buy into what you're watching. That was probably one of those games uh, up until injury time. Yeah, that was incredible. I, I, I can ex- I can remember exactly where I was. Uh, I was I was I was actually down in, in Barrow in Furness, and I can just remember that first goal going in and thinking, oh well, we, we got one. Grace, and then a minute later, and then that happens. I just didn't know what to do with myself. I really don't. But I suppose there are the, the, those little highlights that you just you can keep on for yourself. But I have to ask, what is your favourite bit of commentary that you've done, and what is your favourite commentary that you've heard from a different commentator? We lost audio. I think we might have lost all Matthew's audio for a second. Um, he's just he's just going to come come back in and come back out. By the look at this, he's going to refresh himself. Out and so, in. What? Out and in. Exactly. What's your favourite bit of Matthew Ray's their commentary? There, Sam. While waiting for him. It's tough because there's there's actually quite a few, and like I don't want to like blow smoke up his backside just because he's on the show or whatever, but there, there's, there's been quite a few, and I'm a great admirer of his and Ando's work. I think they're an incredible partnership, but I do like, I do enjoy that too, too, because of the, the, the chaos of it. Um, Ando's one liner after the first goal goes in, um, where he just says dodgy keeper about Jordan Pickford. And then the scenes that ensued was everyone originally thought like Isaac Hayden had scored and then no, it was a Lejeune brace. It was just chaos and anarchy and, and, the pair of them was were, were like fans being able to 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 sum it all up for us as it, as it was happening. Um, there's loads. There's been there's been a few this season as well. Like you couldn't help but get caught up in in the atmosphere of of the last few home games of the season. Your Leicester's, your Arsenal. I think the Arsenal um, game was a, was a very special night. Um, as Matthew mentioned again, there the, the Wilson chance from about thirty five yards out. Um, if that would have gone in, oof, there would have been some uh, some shrill noises. Uh, I don't know, but what about you? Mine's the Matty Longstaff moment against um, Manchester United, which I'm yeah. sure Matthew will tell us all about because he is coming yeah. back. Matthew is back. He is back from refreshing his computer, refreshing his phone, wherever. Yeah. But <laughs> Matthew, can you tell us what is your favourite bit of commentary? Since you've been working on BBC Radio Newcastle as the main commentator, and what's your favourite bit of commentary from a, another commentator or a favourite commentator of yours? Uh, you can hear me now. I hope. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Great. Great. Excellent. <laughs> I'm sorry about the technical problems. Um, That's okay. Well, I mean, in, in terms of other commentators, 
I mean, there's so many that I, that I admire. Uh, I, I want to say that across the BBC local radio network, there are there are lots of brilliant commentators you you probably never heard of because you'd have no reason to listen to them. Um, but but we get to um, obviously meet them at games and um, you know the uh, man who does Brighton for Radio Sussex, Johnny Cantor is is excellent. Chris Gorham who does Norwich for Radio Norfolk is um, is likewise. Um, there's Adam Pope who does Leeds United for for Radio Leeds who's been doing it a long time and. Uh, a bit of a legend there and there are many many others as well um who i haven't mentioned who are very much at the top of their game in local radio um nationally i mean we hear a lot of um great moments don't we and i think we see the clips online a lot from peter drury um whether it's champions league or um premier league that he he does um perhaps for overseas broadcasters i'm a big fan of him and, and i think we all remember you you'll have seen this the the roma goal um the uh in the champions league it was yeah oh, wow um he is yeah he's, it, it's just pure poetry and and genius i think from from peter drury um i mean there's so many of his uh, and i used to enjoy when he commentated on on the premiership as it was then on itv yeah. on newcastle um all those years ago um as i mentioned earlier i listened to a lot of radio so um, maybe not necessarily a particular moment, but um, on, on Radio 5 Live, um, the likes of John Murray, who's from Northumberland, um, and Ian Dennis, uh, who used to commentate on Newcastle for BBC Newcastle in the in the late 90s, and our commentary of uh, the Aspria hat-trick against Barcelona uh, was done by Ian Dennis. Um, I mean, they are two of the very best, and, and they always nail the big moments um and 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 deliver the big game so brilliantly as does conor mcnamara uh, the uh, irish uh, commentator on on five live who you, you probably have heard his work um he does a lot of other sport and tv games as well um yeah and and i want to mention as well of course the, the great mick lowes who um I, I think just with with real distinction covered newcastle on the BBC and commercial radio for 25 years in total. And, um, you know, I was lucky enough to work with Mick for, for about 10 years, starting off behind the scenes and then on, on air a bit more. Um, and getting, you know, to understand at close quarters just why he was so brilliant. Um, listening to him made me want to get involved in, in the media. And you think about some of the big moments that Newcastle have had in what, People of our age would probably say is the modern era, um, but it is going back further and further now. Um, he was there; his voice is on it. Um, you know, in more recent times, recent-ish, the four-four against Arsenal and his his brilliant commentary of, of Chetiotti's equaliser, Shearer's record-breaking goal. Um, and he was there for some of the Champions League nights uh, as well, and obviously title-chasing um, seasons. So there's just so many fantastic moments uh, that, that he delivered and, and the Ben Arthur goal against Bolton. Um, we did a programme on the radio about 10 years ago now called Commentary Moments and, and we asked people to to pick something from Newcastle, Sunderland, non-league and maybe other sports as well as a favourite and, and a lot of fans, a lot of listeners loved the way that Mick um, screened Hat and Ben Arthur and, uh, you know, in amongst doing everything else for that particular goal which was a sensational goal and, and he got it as he always did and, and does absolutely spot on. And, and now I've talked about Ian Dennis there, my colleague, Nick Barnes, who does Sunderland now was Newcastle commentator for BBC Newcastle um, from 98 to 2003 uh, when Mick rejoined the BBC. Um, I mean, Nick's an award-winning broadcaster and, and has produced some great moments um, for Sunderland as well. Um, there have been a lot of ups and downs for him there, but he is fantastic. And I know um, the affection that there is for um, a great man in, in Justin Lockwood and also Pete Graves, who are you know two award-winning top-level broadcasters. But um, to bring it back to Mick, I think he is the definitive voice of Newcastle United and, and always will be number one um, because he just... Um, performed and did everything at such a high standard and, and really transformed the way that it was done. Um, and yeah, sometimes I, 
and listen back to to his goals when we need uh, need something. We've got a guest coming on or or whatever, or we're doing some archiving, and it's always a pleasure um, because he, yeah, for me, he's the best. Yeah, but people do that with your commentary now, Matthew. People, <laughs> young kid, young students around uh, the northeast and beyond are, are listening to Mary Longstaff hit it and yeah. stuff like that. But yeah, it, that was it, the it, part of your question, wasn't it? Yeah, I think that, that's probably <laughs> probably one of my one of my favourite ones um, because it just it, it all seemed to come together nicely and and I mean it, it was all about him and his goal and uh, and the fans and the club. Not about us, but, but we've got to try and do it do it justice. Like I say, um, at risk of repeating myself, and I think we did there. I mean, there've been others that have been probably fairly inconsequential goals that that might have just been described in a in a tidy way, and and you can be quite pleased with that. Um, there's others where I think, why didn't you shut up sooner? Or you should have said that. You should have gone on longer. So that's part of listening back and, and the analysis that, that I do and, and that we do. Um, and the Lejeune goal against Everton, the second one, we didn't know it was Lejeune until some time after. Um, I mean, that's it's just pure chaos. And I guess it reflected what was happening in the penalty box at that time. But if I could do it again, I'd probably make it a bit tidier. Um, the best bit about that was Ando beforehand and, uh, and afterwards, actually, beforehand because of a free kick in the centre circle and he said something like, we'll get another one here or yeah. we'll equalise. Um, <laughs> and of course they did. And then, and I'm sure it was after that second goal, um, when we were wa- trying to watch the replay. And Everton is the tightest media area in the Premier League. You've got no leg room. Once you're in, you're in. There are two fairly big replay screens. I mean, not probably like actually probably like laptop sized tv screens you've got to stretch to to see them so after the goal went in the the equalizer and the players were running away and i was getting excited um we were try. i was out of my seat trying to see what had gone on i couldn't so i kept going and kept going so that ando could have a look at the replay and i just all i can remember afterwards was about pickford he just said dodgy keeper yeah, <laughs> and, and that that gets quoted back to him and to me quite a lot. Um, but yeah, but that goal, I think probably um, it was it was just manic, wasn't it? I'd, I'd probably like to do it differently if it happened again. But that sort of thing will never happen again. No, no, no. It's perfect. I was just saying when you were sorting your audio out, that line, dodgy keeper for Amanda, it's just perfect, <laughs> and the chaos of it. No, I wouldn't change a thing. It was brilliant, but. Obviously, you say you you watch a lot of football, listen to a lot of football. Is there a, a co-commentator that you listen to and you think, oh, I wouldn't mind working with you one day? Um, whew, I think Pat Nevin on Radio 5 Live is very good. Um, you can tell that he's a very intelligent man uh, that comes across in his commentary. Uh, I've met him a few times at games and he's, he's very nice. Um, with this season, actually, when, when Ando was away, missed a couple of games um he was fine he was just on holiday um we were lucky to have um because that's what everyone asked that was the question um he was absolutely fine um we had Andy Woodman for the Brentford match and yeah. uh, that was oh, I mean I'll call it a stroke of luck in the sense that he's manager of Bromley in the National League and they were the odd team out in a 23 team division so they didn't have a game um so he said he'd come and do the match well he played for Brentford and obviously Freddie his son contracted to Newcastle but he worked with some of the players he knew a lot of the staff he knew some of the Brentford lads from his time at Arsenal so there were so many nice links and connections um and when that all comes together like that that was great and and as you've probably seen on a on another podcast stroke YouTube uh channel his um his chat about his time at Newcastle haven't you on the under the Kosh program, uh, and what a character! But but also what a genuinely, genuinely nice um, and approachable man he is and was. And then the following week, uh, the great Steve Harper agreed to fill in, and yeah, club employee managing the academy now. Um, but he, he had a relationship working with us at BBC Newcastle, co-presenting our Total Sports Show for a season when he was playing at Hull. And he had done a game with me. Uh, it was actually Brighton away. Um, another 2-1 Newcastle win. That was in the championship. And he stepped um, 
stepped into Ando's shoes. And because again, because Steve knew a lot of the players because he'd been part of Steve Bruce's staff for a little while. Um, and he also played for Brighton, knew some of their staff and, and, yeah. and had it had a good insight because he's a student of the game and, and I mean a, a very, very smart and an impressive person anyway, Steve Harper. And he was able to give us a different type of insight. So we were really lucky when Ando wasn't there to have um, to have those two filling in. Yeah, it's not too bad. It's not too bad. They weren't bad goalkeepers as well, Andy Williams. No. He played so many games in goal. And obviously, Steve Harper as well. Fantastic. Same for Newcastle. Mm. Uh, again, you've, you've, had, you've, had, you've been very, very fortunate to have the likes of, the, the likes of uh, Andy Woodman. Uh, John Anderson, of course, that we've been talking about in great detail, and of course, Steve Harbour as well. Um, I think one thing I'd like to know in particular, Matthew, is it difficult to express an opinion on the game because that's not your job, really, is it? Yeah. Um, first and foremost, I'm there to, to tell you what's happening. So where the ball is on the pitch, which team's got the ball, um, and in radio commentary, one of the, the sort of the fundamentals is is the score because people are listening to the radio then they probably don't know what the score is how long's gone in the game i know the way that we follow football now is that we'll have a second screen or maybe a third screen so you might have the radio on uh, or be listening through the club website and and you're on twitter you're watching soccer saturday or or, or whatever um Final score on the BBC, um, <laughs> uh, which I think I think is Red Button, um, yeah. isn't it? At least for part of it, um, a long-running program. So it is a bit different, but but obviously a lot of people listen when they're at work or when they're driving, or, or maybe maybe they just want to listen. And they're not bothered about other stuff. So those are the things that I have to get across: where the ball is on the pitch, uh, you know, which team has it, um, what's happening. Here's the score. Here's the time. I've got to mention the, the name of the station that we're on, and, and that's the case for anyone on on radio branding. Um, and as I said earlier, the co-commentators there to to give you the analysis. To, to I'll say what's happened. They they should tell you why, and and tell you if it's good or bad or, or whatever, um, and any other analysis insight they can offer. Um, but as I've said, that there will be times when I will. I maybe talk about the, the direction of travel in a game. Um, I mean, that Brighton match that, I would, that Steve Harper was with us for, I mean, for 10 minutes, I don't, think, I don't think Newcastle had the ball. So a lot of, a lot of what I was doing then is, is say, with, with help from Steve, with his analysis, is you know, Brighton are having another attack. Newcastle can't, can't get it. I mean, Brighton have you know, been, been on top. So I'll, I will be giving an, an opinion like that. I'll, I will... Um, you know, give a perspective, maybe something just quite general, quite broad about the way the game is going and then hopefully get a bit more detail from the, the co-commentator. It's probably times when I've been maybe a bit too opinionated, maybe a bit too critical, perhaps a bit too excited and a bit too positive um, and, and gone a bit too far. Um, but generally, I'll, I'll try to do that. And, and the same with Newcastle, if, you know, if they have their first shot on 35 minutes or, um, you know, they've missed three good chances in the opening 15 minutes i'll probably say something like well you know they should be at least one nil up and it's normally followed up with you hope they don't regret those chances that they've missed that kind of thing so it can be difficult to express an opinion i think i've just got to do it in the right way and remember why i'm there and why we have a, a second voice a co-commentator and and most of the opinion the analysis criticism praise should should come from them but but there's elements of that in, in what i do yeah um one game that uh, i bet you never thought in a million years you'd be commentating on this season is uh newcastle united women against anik town ladies yeah um, what a fantastically surreal day not least because we were in the press box as well that day but <laughs> um what did you make of that because it was just one of my absolute favorite days at st james's park yeah um well, I mean, I'd like to hear more, more about it from, from you as well, because it, it was fantastic. And I have to say, I don't think I appreciated the scale of it um, until the kickoff was put back. I mean, I knew it was going to be big. I think we all did. Um, we knew there'd be a good crowd. Um, but for it to be um, 
the size that it was was um I, actually i think probably for the club and for the, the people involved with the women's team quite moving um and brilliant brilliant support and what a fantastic day and it was done so well wasn't it i know um there were flags and banners involved uh, but the club i think they 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 allowed for possibly up to 30,000 so so they had they were able to accommodate more fans who would come up on the day and force the game to be put back and for us we we were doing a women's football special we we had someone at Sunderland ladies uh, we sent someone down to Charlton um two people actually for for Durham women we had two people at Sunderland um so it was great for us to to be a bit quite ambitious with our programming and do that and then we had sort of spells of 10 15 minutes commentary from each game but, but goal updates otherwise um it was fantastic and also it was a really really good spectacle wasn't it there were the goals um despite letting in four i thought the anik keeper was was incredible she was brilliant <laughs> wasn't she <laughs> Um, and, I, and I hope that those people who, who don't see a lot of women's football will have will have been impressed by the setup, but also the standard. And, and they're not professional, are they? They're not full time at that level. So um, I think it was it was probably really good for the reputation of that level of women's football. But um, I think it's it's opened the door to it for a lot of supporters. And it's fantastic that the club want to bring them on board. And, and watching Dan Ashworth's club website interview yesterday, it's one of the things he talked about as being part of his remit. But it's a brilliant day, wasn't it? And, and you had a, as good a view as I did from, from your seats. And um, just an exciting match, wasn't it? It was just... Go on, Sam, you explain. For, for, like we'd been covering the the women on the channel for a couple of years as well, so we'd we'd followed their story and like they're all childhood Newcastle fans, the same as all of us, and like I th it was just massive for them, and it was just such a shame that they'd lost two games all season and yet they can't get they couldn't get promoted and and there's but there's so there were so many kind of stories just wrapped up in that day from whether it was. Captain Brooke Cochran, who'd come back, worked so hard to come back from an ACL, which not many people can come back from, like playing a final home game or whatever, before she retires. Um, Becky Langley, who will manage in the WSL one day, with or without Newcastle United. I've no doubt about that whatsoever. And there's players of great potential there. And Georgia Gibson, was it's just different gravy, a set-piece yeah. delivery, and it was just absolute filth but yeah to, to, to see Amanda and Mirdad who, who we who we met didn't we Johnny on the day and and for us to be allowed pitch side at St James's Park you know for a fat man sat in his kitchen doing these things to to do pitch side interviews at St James's is just ridiculous yeah you couldn't keep a smile off your face Sam and that was probably the best thing because everybody that went there left with a with a smile on their face because the football was good the, the good feel factor around the clubs in such a good place. I don't think I've ever seen it as such a mm. as such a high at the minute. It's been fantastic. But yeah, like we obviously we've been Lee's I have a shout out to Lee because Lee's been covering the women's team since Newcastle Fans T V was formed. So that tells you how long that's been and it didn't really get any mm. I think any appreciation really until the last three or four years, I suppose. But it's been it's been brilliant to see the girls blossom. And hopefully they'll have a fantastic season next year. I have to ask Matthew. As, um, I would go as far as to say, sorry, on. just on that women's game is probably one of the best experiences I've had at St James's Park yeah. in, in recent years. And this season, well, you know, maybe the Everton game um, and the Arsenal match certainly would be would be ahead of it, but probably not many others. And I think you're right, Johnny, with what you said there, just about the feel good factor around the entire club. Not just the the men's team, the first team, it extends beyond that, and and the women's team is is part of that now, and and probably never more a bigger part of the club, and and that will only get stronger. So, um, it's it's exciting for them, and and I and I think as they become a bigger part of Newcastle United, which is, I think, what probably everyone would feel that they should be, um, the exposure, the media coverage will only increase, won't it? And and that's good for the profile of, of the Newcastle United women's team because in the northeast it's been Sunderland ladies with all the players they've produced and the success they've had and in 
more recent years, Durham women um, who've who've done well also, but Newcastle have been a little bit further behind, but but they'll be looking to close that gap. I think as well, it, it just drew another line. <laughs> another. There's been a lot of lines drawn under the previous ownership, but that that one was there as well. How much they were just neglected and. Thankfully, the foundation and guys like Steve Harrell have, have made sure like this this team still kept going. And but you're right, having to it's like childhood Newcastle footballers supporters having to go to Sunderland to 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 get any sort of football, it's it's just so wrong, isn't it? But it, it was just. I mean, I made a seven hour round trip that day. It looks like three and a half hours to Newcastle from where I am in the Midlands, which I, I do often. I mean. To, to watch a tier four, like a League Two women's match, my wife thought I was crazy, but it was just so worth it. It was just one of the best days ever. And like, there was like, so many families there who had obviously just been taking their kids to their first game. And it, I thought it was a really uplifting, inspiring day. And I, I hope they get yeah. to do it again. Sorry, just on that point, I think it was an opportunity to introduce some younger fans to St. James's Park because at the minute, you can't get into a men's first team game. <laughs> You can't get a ticket, so it might have been someone's first chance to, to see a team in black and white stripes at St James's, and, and if they can play there more often, hopefully, it might be the only way in for a little while for some fans. So I think it was really important in that sense that if some people got their first taste of St James's Park that day, that it was such a such a memorable occasion. Um, and you know, it's a few months ago, people didn't want to go. A couple of years ago, the club had to give away ten thousand half season tickets now you can't get a ticket you can't get in and, and that's that's where the club is from from where it was sam will be listening to your commentary more intently than ever because of that three and a half hour round well seven hour round trip in the end but uh, yeah well really especially if tickets are like what they uh fortunately carl uh who's on our channel was uh couldn't make the leicester game that's why i was in his seat which oh. uh I will thank him for forever. Although, quick funny story, which I don't think I've told on the channel before. I was sat next to Carl's brother, um, Chris, and when Bruno scored the winner, <laughs> scenes obviously ensued. Chris went to climb the rails in order to to jump on the uh, to run on the pitch, which we obviously don't condone, and he didn't. He got one leg up, thought better of it, <laughs> tried to get his leg down, couldn't, and when he did. He didn't realise until after we got out the ground, he cut all the back of his leg and it was just dripping with blood, bless him. I think he got a tattoo the week after to cover up the bruise, but it just didn't matter because we'd won in the last minute. And when, when that happened, it doesn't you'd, you'd take a bit of a cut and a bruise for three points every week, wouldn't you? That will have numbed the pain, the goal. <laughs> uh, but you need, you need to do something, don't you? You need, you need, you need to react and get it out and and we would obviously that was vocally for us a lot and and I was out of his seat which is which is rare so um you know unlike unlike your um your your colleague on the day wasn't um or his brother wasn't trying to get on the pitch but um yeah you just you've got to do something go somewhere haven't you and, and react yeah yeah definitely definitely we have to briefly talk about the summer um mm -hmm. it's been a very busy week at Newcastle. I keep on saying that week in, week out with Newcastle United. Dan Ashworth, you just touched on it before, of course, uh, and just done an interview, obviously he's just been confirmed as sporting director of Newcastle United, which I think is a real, real coup for the club, I have to be honest. So very, very impressed with Dan Ashworth and his previous roles at Brighton, the FA, West Bromwich Albion. The list goes on. And Matt Target, as we record, has just signed a four-year deal at Newcastle for Aston Villa. The good news keeps on coming, Matthew, and mm -hmm. I have to be honest, I think you've probably got the best job in the world in the next three or four years, potentially, if everything comes into fruition. What do you make of the news this week in regards to Dan Ashworth and Matt Target in particular? Though? Yeah, Dan Ashworth is, is such a significant appointment, um, firstly because it's him and because he is so well thought of in football because of the work he's done elsewhere. That's his reputation um, uh, stands, and it's it's not by accident, is it? He's he's been at West Brom, at Brighton. He's been at the Football Association, um, and and done very impressive work. And and that's the sort of person that Newcastle need. 
what I'd always felt previously was that there was just a real absence of football expertise at boardroom level. Um, um, it's probably not a new observation, is it? But, you know, in, in, in previous times, you had Lee Charnley as managing director, and I think he was the club's only director. Now you have a consortium, um, three different groups owning the club. You have now four board members with the addition of a, of a fourth um, not so long ago. And you have a sporting director, someone um, in a position of power to take a, a broad view of, of the club's sporting operations um, from the first team and transfers to uh, the academy, training ground, the women's team, everything that, that he mentioned in his club website interview. And I think that's something that the club has really lacked and, and has been missing. So that will benefit them. But to get somebody like that, it's such a, an impressive move for Newcastle to make to get somebody of his calibre uh, and a, a man of his his eminence, I guess. So that is exciting. And um, as, as we know, and as I'm sure you've talked about, they've been looking for a new chief executive as well. So that will be another you know, senior managerial appointment that will be coming. And, and the club is just being restructured, isn't it? But uh, it's exciting. But I, I guess it's probably just bringing Newcastle in line with what other Premier League clubs are like. And that that had been a frustration over the years, and 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 like I've just said, you know, there was there was Lee Charnley probably on his own with all of the power, but none of the power because Mike Ashley was still the owner. Um, and while there were a lot of mistakes made, um, it was probably a very difficult position to be in. And if it wasn't him, it would be someone else. Um, so I think the club has needed this kind of leadership and and this sort of change at the top. Um, and, and it's good that things are happening. Matt Target, I'm delighted because he's been so good. Uh, and I remember when Rafa Benitez wanted to sign him and that was going to be a loan deal, wasn't it? Maybe August 2017. And it probably felt a bit underwhelming at the time. And, and it was a move that didn't happen. Um, but I'm glad they've got him now. And that loan from Aston Villa was a, a fantastic piece of business to get him permanently and to get it done early as well is terrific. And, and this had been something that um, I think had, had irritated fans over the years because Newcastle used to seem to wait or, or be delayed with all their business and not get things done early. Um, and I know Rafa Benitez, for example, always wanted players in early because he could then have time to work with them, get them up to speed on, on what he wanted, his instructions, his way of playing. That's probably true for most managers. Um, but players would often come in quite late in the window and and then it might take a little bit of time. I mean, I think Salomon Rondon came in just before the season started. We didn't see much of him in the first couple of months. Maybe if they'd been able to get him a little bit earlier, he could have been ready to go at the start of the season. I think he might have had an injury in pre-season anyway, but, but there's just one example. And hopefully they can get a few more done soon. I mean, we all know the names that are out there and... and um, whether it's Sven Botman or Hugo Ekitike and, and others, it will be nice if when they come back for pre-season training on the on the 1st of July um, that there's a few new signings there. And I know Matt Targ's on a new player, but he's in Newcastle's permanent signing, um, which is significant. So um, the January transfer window was like nothing else. Um, hopefully the summer will be less fraught, but it's just... It's just different now and, and every window will be different. And there might be some transfer windows in the future where Newcastle aren't as active because maybe they don't need to be. But when they're trying to improve and trying to recruit players actively, um, it is exciting. It's it's just a different way of doing things, isn't it, uh, to what we saw before. And compare this summer to last summer when there wasn't much money um, at all. They looked at loan players. They couldn't get them, missed out on a few um, famously the Hamza Chowdhury thing on, on deadline day and, and that saga and they managed to get Joe Willock back but that was it and it was an awful summer it was just an ordeal of a transfer window well it's um, it's different now and, and that's for the better isn't it Absolutely I mean do you think the the club record transfer fee will get uh, blown out of the water this, this summer because I suppose Whilst the likes of, of Trippier and, and Bruno are, I'd say, marquee-ish signings, they're obviously awesome players and they've 
can't praise them enough. But they're not in the the sort of sexy positions on the pitch, are they? Although that they're making it look sexy at the moment. Do you think Newcastle are going to maybe spend fifty million on on a winger or a striker or or, or somewhere like that? Well, financial fair play will obviously come into things, and um, you know there may well be have to be the structuring of payments across a deal, which might well be worth um, what would be a club record, but you know an initial payment or an initial outlay might not be that. I think with Almiron, which was which was a club record at the time, they something like twenty one, and they finally broke the the Michael Owen record. I, I, I'm not. I'm not sure whether they paid initially more than than what they paid out for Owen, and then there were extras on on top of that. Um, so that's something that they've got to be mindful of, haven't they, with financial fair play? Um, but but they they did well in January. They were very skillful with what they did um, with a loan and and what they paid for Trippier and and Burn as well, I guess in particular. Bruno was a big yeah. signing and. Chris Wood, well, that was the release clause. They needed a striker and they paid it. Um, the club's, I guess, got the capabilities now to go and do that. It, do you know what, though? I don't really care because I think that they will make sensible signings. They'll make good signings. And, and, and I trust them with Eddie Howe and the people working with him and Dan Ashworth now and, and the people running the club in the boardroom to, to do the right things and make sure that the squad has what it needs, which has been... A problem for a number of years. It was imbalanced, wasn't it? Rafa Benitez talked about that. Steve Bruce talked about it. I mean, last year, he wanted to strengthen the spine of the team. Couldn't do it. Knew that there were players that needed to, to be moved on, um, you know, respectfully, because you need to make way for new signings. Now, I just think that they'll do it properly. They won't get every player that they target. That was the case in January. Um, obviously, back in for... <laughs> Some of them now in the summer, but um, I just think that the approach will be will be refreshing to, to what they do and doing it properly. Um, and whether that means spending big money or not, or, or getting good value for money, which is always satisfying. And whether it's a deal like Trippier um, or, or even Bruno, who probably the, the level he plays at will be value for money in time. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, it's just it, it's it's. I think it's it's nice to know that they're going to go about things now in a in a different way, in a way that's more conducive to the sort of longer term success that we all want to see. A more professional way, if you like. Let's let's be honest. Let's be honest. Uh, finally, Matthew, what has been the moments that you've? Is there been a particular moment that you can remember since? November 2016, where you just go, just puts a smile on your face and just think, oh my God, I wish I could live, relive that moment again. Is it a particular game? Is it an incident? Is it something that you just go, wow, I, I, I wish I, I wish I could go back there? Well, I mean, firstly, I just know I'm very, very lucky to be to be in a position where I can watch Newcastle every week and, and get to commentate on the games because it is a, it's, it's a dream of mine. Um, and there's a level of responsibility that comes with it that, that I don't take lightly, but... I'm trying to enjoy it more now uh, and I've probably relaxed a bit more in the last couple of years. Um, so, yeah, I think um, I think just, just being there and having the excitement of going to a game, you know, the match might not be brilliant. The 90 minutes in recent years has often been the worst part of it. But as fans, the going to the game is always exciting. I mean, the travelling that you have to do uh, to get up to St James's Park and then back again, you know, I can understand that from another perspective because there aren't many close away games, um, and it's awful when you travel back after a defeat. But but the going there is is exciting, you know, wondering what's going to happen. Um, you know, I've been very fortunate uh, with Rafa Benitez, who was absolutely brilliant to me and great to work with, very helpful. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about things that that weren't. Newcastle or football related, a fascinating man, a brilliant man, um, and, and, and an honour to be to be around him and, and just to listen to him talk about Newcastle or, or about other things, um, whether it was Spanish politics or um, trying to give me a Spanish lesson, um, which he did a few times. Um, uh, yeah, and, and I have to say as well, um, not a popular person among the Newcastle fan base, but 
Steve Bruce was very good to deal with as well. I didn't know him before Newcastle because I, I didn't cover Sunderland, of course, and, and wasn't around um, during his time there. Um, but very, very helpful, uh, very personable, very nice, um, very just very good to deal with. He, interesting bloke, had a lot of really good stories that um, I think fans would probably have enjoyed hearing. Um, there's a slightly different, more relaxed, more gregarious side to him that you wouldn't have seen on camera. That doesn't mean that he was the right man for the job, but um, a lot of people speak highly of him as a person and, and in my it's limited dealings with him. Um, I would say that he was always very good to me. And and um, you know, when Ando and I had COVID last year, he was um, he was quick to check on us a few times and see how we were. So that was that was um, a nice thing to do. And, and Eddie Howe as well has been. I don't know him that well. We haven't had that much time in front of him, um, but has been has been helpful and been very good to deal with and very nice as well. So lucky with the managers, definitely. Um, the, the promotion from the championship was um, a mad few minutes, wasn't it? Uh, we had a reporter at Villa Park who was covering Brighton uh, Brighton against Aston Villa there. So um, we threw to him. And then when the, the equaliser had gone in, um, you know, we were getting that in our headphones and the radio listeners were getting it live. And that's part of the beauty, I think, of live radio, the immediacy. And then Ando and I were telling people nearby we couldn't speak but we were telling them one one and trying to pass on the message and then chris my colleague who was who was at the game at villa park he was the one that delivered the news that newcastle were champions so we didn't get to do that someone else did but um that was a special day at st james's um and i think obviously the obviously the takeover um which which we won't forget um as, as a quick aside on that um it's been controversial for many reasons and Issues keep coming up, which I fully understand why they are there and why they have to be reported on, talked about, questions asked. The point that I made a lot when I was on other BBC outlets, um, whether that was TV or radio, nationally, regionally, other local radio stations talking about it, was that for Newcastle fans, as, as I saw it, any takeover was about the end of the Mike Ashley era, because that's what fans had been campaigning for for nearly a decade and a half. And if the fans had any control over who owned the club, well, Mike Ashley wouldn't have been there for 14 and a half years. Um, so that was the point that I was always keen to get across it, while mindful of um, the aspects of the new ownership that um, didn't sit right with some people. Um, but a, a brilliant day. Great to be at St. James's with among all the fans and all the noise and the partying. Um, and I would say as well, finally, the Arsenal game at the end of the season, because... I don't think I've witnessed St James's part like that. Um, the people who have been going for a long time had said to me that it hasn't been that good for 20 years, and, and I believe them. Um, everything felt big. It sounded big. It was a great performance, a great result. Should have won by more. Um, the, the lap around the pitch afterwards, the field goal factor, Johnny, that you've talked about was there. It was, it was special. It was brilliant. Um, loved every second, and, and hopefully... There'll be a bit more like that in the future. And, and that's what we have now, isn't it? The hope that there'll be more great days, nights, games, atmospheres like that to come. Whatever the club achieves, however much time it takes to get higher up the table and, and to do the sorts of things they want to do, that, that hope exists now, doesn't it? Oh, doesn't it just? I mean, just a yes or no, Matthew, as, as a one final, final one. I'm not going to ask you for a prediction for next season. All I'm going to say is, have you got your passport sorted? <laughs> uh, I, I had some passport trouble a few weeks ago. So um, <laughs> for other reasons, um, nothing nothing dodgy, just um, it expired. Um, and uh, so I've, I've just had it sorted. So I've got 10 years on it. Um, oh. So hopefully Newcastle will be, will be back there. And that's realistic, isn't it? We know that the club can. Um, you asked for a yes or a no, but you, you we know that they, <laughs> you know that we know that the club can can sit comfortably, and 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 can exist in at, at that level, can't it? In Europe, and we've been there before, so it'd be great to go back and, and go back with with regularity, um, and that's exciting. And, and do you know what? In the league, not a prediction, but just for it to be comfortable next season, 
that would be progress. Look at look at Wolves this year. Uh, Brighton, I know they they had a bit of a slide and and were below Newcastle for a little bit, but to not have the relegation worries, which I think all of the last is it maybe six or seven Premier League seasons have had some form of relegation threat in them. So to not have that next season would be would be wonderful. It would be wonderful. This interview has been wonderful as well. I've really enjoyed your company, Matthew, and it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you about all things Newcastle United. I'm sure we'll hear a Bruno shout like you did against Arsenal or maybe something like uh, Callum Wilson goal or... Hugo Ekatike. TK, exactly. That could be something as well. Well, yeah, could could be uh, could be a new player, couldn't it? Could be someone that we, we haven't even mentioned. I just want to say very, finally, quickly, if I can, I guess if anyone's watching this, apart from your regular followers, it might be because they have some sort of interest in, in the media um, or football commentary. Um, they they can, if that's the case, feel free to contact me through Twitter or, or anything else. And if they're looking for advice or, or pointers or, or even um, you know help with contacting other people in the media, I'll, I'll, I'll be very happy to to do that and, and pass on any um, any advice or guidance that I can, whatever stage they're at, whether they're um, a student or just out of university or, or maybe a bit older trying to, trying to get into the media. Um, or a yeah. fat man in his kitchen. <laughs> but yeah, feel yeah, free to, man, um, yeah, to, to get in touch. Yeah, top man, Matthew. It's a bit of class there as well. So if you do want to speak to Matthew again, the door's always open particularly via Twitter, which he's mentioned just there as well. So if you're thinking about getting into the industry, believe me, as soon as you get your foot in the door, you'll never want to leave it, believe it or not. Uh, But it's been an absolute pleasure. It really has been, Matthew. Really, really enjoyed it. Sam, where can everybody uh, listen to this podcast later on? Links in the description for the audio podcast. Uh, Hit the subscribe button, hit five-star reviews, and the uh, audio podcast is out every Tuesday. So from myself, Jonathan Greenwood, Sam Mulner, and our guests, BBC Radio Newcastle's Matthew Raysbeck. We'll see you all very soon.